Match Chat, episode 143, featuring the first part of a brand new interview series with George Sanger, aka The Fat Man. Now, while uh, George isn't particularly fat, he is particularly brilliant, not just as a, not just as a talented musician, which he certainly is, uh, but also with the engineering and the coding and all that stuff that goes on uh, to make the music possible in some of the earliest and most innovative games. So we've got a lot of stuff to cover. So without further ado, here is The Fat Man. All right, folks, I am here with George Singer, a.k.a. The Fat Man. He has uh, composed over 200 uh, different compositions, or he's the 200 different uh, computer games and video games. He's been in the industry since 1983. Uh, just a few of his pieces include uh, The Seventh Guest, Wing Commander, Hard Nova, Maniac Mansion, Loom, and Tux Racer. He's also an author. He's got a great book out called The Fat Man on Game Audio, <laughs> Tasty Morsels of Sonic Goodness. And uh, by the way, that's on the Match Hat Required Reading List. He's also got a band, uh, Team Fat, with three albums out. <laughs> How you doing, George? I'm doing all right, Matt. How are you? Uh, I'm doing uh, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I just thought we'd start by talking about what kind of projects are you up to right now. Uh, what am I doing right now? Um, some of the stuff that's right up in my face is it's mostly slot machines. Uh, I just got through a string of slot machines where I was doing an Australian themed one, a, uh, B Brat Pack jazz themed one, um, a uh, American Indian themed one. And what was, what was the, th the other one? Okay, I can't remember, <laughs> but uh, it was like everything. Uh, so, so musical styles. I'm, I'm doing these things, and I and I just pitched a. Uh, I just threw out my first extended abstract for a white paper, for a conference that was inspired by Marvin Minsky, um, Artif called Music, Mind, guy, and Invention. Right? Yeah. Yeah, he's the artificial intelligence guy, and he wrote a paper about uh, music, mind, and invention. And uh, I threw a paper out for that, which uh, what? It, it didn't it didn't make the cut. But uh, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to throw down with some academics a little bit and see what I can uh, see what kind of dirt I can stir up. Uh, I'm just thinking with the slot machines, that's got to be, or with the slot machines, that's kind of interesting because they tend to be like back, you know, side to side to side, like three, you know, two dozen of them, right? Do you have to factor that in when you're making music for them to make, make sure they harmonize or something like that? Well, for a long time, it seemed like there were only a handful of people who realized that when they're making sound for a slot machine that, no, it's not a solo. It's, it's an ensemble piece. It's a jam. And the key is C major for crying out loud. And if you do something in C sharp, everybody's going to sound bad. Uh, so the first part of it was keep it in C major and we'll all be cool. But beyond that, uh, the next step has been, you know, companies trying to climb over each other and find ways to be louder or attract more attention. So it gets kind of clamorous. But I think that the way that it's headed now is something that I considered getting patented, but I don't think I really want patents. Um, I'm, I'm working toward getting our slot machines to, we're networked to all the machines next to us. And I want the sounds from your machine to come out the machines next to it. I want to create pieces that use all of the speakers in the room to generate a single sonic landscape I could you know I mean if if each slot machine is playing like one orchestral instrument you'd get a sound that you can't get anywhere else in the world in you know in a unique environment like that so I'm working on expanding the uh, it's tricky because I have to be subversive about it you know how these skunk works projects go I have to kind of sneak it into something that the company realizes is necessary oh I thought you was afraid uh, somebody might try to steal the idea I'm just not really, I don't really worry about that. I, I've realized that every, for everything that I think I came up with, you know, somebody else came up with it too. Uh, we were simultaneously enlightened, you know. These, if an idea is ready to be had, everybody has it. 
uh, you can read about that in the history of any any science or any art. Um, but uh, this is one that I've been harping on with this company for over 10 years, and I think we're coming up to being ready to do it. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that. So, so that good question that you asked, yes. Uh, beyond taking into account what the other machines are doing, I'd like to have influence over what the other machines are doing, at least insofar as those machines are created by this company. And I'd like to, uh, I'd like to have the whole room be, you know, how would Walt Disney do it? I'd like to have the whole thing work in a coordinated way to, to bring you something, to put something on the table that you can't get anywhere else. You mentioned uh, Walt Disney. Now, I was kind of curious because I saw one of your uh, quotations where you said that you like to compare yourself to Walt Disney. You know, I assume he's kind of a role model, perhaps. I just wondering if you could elaborate well, on that. It's been a while since I've said that one. <laughs> I mean, I don't know a little bit about his history. He's a really interesting. There's a lot of, you know, the most people don't know about him, right? So, I mean, what do you, uh, why do you identify with uh, Walt Disney? Well, the main thing that I admire about him uh, is. Well, the thing that, 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 that glares to me as a, as a kid is, you know, I thought that Disneyland was just the greatest thing. And uh, I thought, wow, how can one human being be so responsible for so much happiness throughout the world? That was kind of my, uh, my younger view of it. And as it's matured, uh, I've seen that um, the emphasis on design without – stopping the imagination um, is is really I think what I admire about him and I and I think the fact that uh, it, that puts him in a category with the Beatles which is yeah he designed a theme park but it's not Hanna-Barbera you know it doesn't stop with Yogi Bear and the Ranger it it's magic and princesses and 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 adventures that that go beyond what's visible so your imagination fills things in there's a certain amount of chaos that you can uh stare into and and see what you need to see in your life so that's i think what's has kind of been distilled from that i don't know if uh, brian moriarty's talk about uh his brian moriarty is an, uh, is a great game producer infocom right and uh, infocom and he also gave I think still gives the the best uh, talks at GDC, and you know, just some of them are just life changers. And I think maybe on Ludix dot com, L U D I X, uh, he might have uh, posted "Who Buried Paul," which is one in which uh, he tells the story of the Paul is dead hoax from the Beatles history, but in it. He explains what it is about the Beatles that made them so great, which was always a mystery to me until I heard that lecture. I mean, it was mystery number one. In the book, I describe it as the prime directive. Find out what that thing is. And they hear Brian Moriarty, a game producer, lays it out, you know. Uh, That's the key. <laughs> it's the haircut. That's the key. Yeah, yeah. It's... Uh, uh, y y y it, there, there's probably a special circuit <laughs> in those Rickenbackers. <laughs> Uh, but but the way that he describes it, he says he describes all the clues to Paul being dead, and he see, shows how you can kind of put them together. You can see things where they might have been intentionally placed, and might not have been intentionally placed, but you can see them in there. And he says that's constellation, not the noun, but the verb. You constellate. You 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 put things together and see what you need to see, and they set up an environment in which you could do that. In which you have a rich environment in which you can look into it and go, yeah, that's that's what I need to to see. And a good example of that in game design uh, is Danielle Berry, also Mule. you know, good Mule, friend right? of uh, yeah. of Bryant's. Mule, yeah. Well, they took that famous. There's a famous incident where uh, there was a bug when you're you're supposed to. Uh, sort of drag this little 8-bit mule character around and get him to go and, and identify a piece of land. Um, you know, you're, you're doing a land rush. and every Four players simultaneously are guiding their little mules around. But it was just hard to control the joystick. It, it was The code was tricky. And it was hard to get them to, uh, 
if you click on that piece of land, sometimes it wouldn't work. And Danielle's brilliant solution to that was that when it didn't work, you have the mule run off the screen to the side, and then you say, well, these mules are really cantankerous. And, and now you've got a much richer world and your imagination's starting to work. And all you've done is exploited a bug. Oh, that's just brilliant. The whole, the whole thing was a yeah. bug. Yeah. <laughs> I played yeah. that game incessantly as a kid. I remember, the, remember exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was frustrating. It was delightfully frustrating because you're yelling at your freaking mule, you know? <laughs> They did have, you know, you remember those guys. They had, they had these personalities, and that was all implied by the fact that they wouldn't, they wouldn't click on your land. There is a way that good engineers communicate, and it's about this far from the way that bad engineers communicate, but it's way far from the way that salesmen communicate. And uh, I always think about Bill Volk, you know, one day. Do you know Bill? No, I heard you mention him a few times in uh, some of your other interviews. Well, I'm going to tell the same story again, probably that you know that that one day he he said uh, he said, oh oh oh, <laughs> I'm doing drag and drop splines on the Z80. You don't want to know how I'm doing it. Don't ask me how I'm doing it. You don't want to know how I'm doing it. Here's how I'm doing it. Right? <laughs> and then proceeded but, to give you all the gory details. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's passion, you know, and. Uh, you can kind of get a sense of what a person's after. They're not, you know, a good engineer, a good game designer isn't going to talk to you about fourth quarter sales and uh, cross promotions. And, uh, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, or even, even the demo that's going to blow the, the money people away. You know, that's, that's where it starts to go wrong is when they start saying, yeah, you know, we're going to blow them away with this demo instead of we're making an awesome game. So, so uh, yeah. And, and that ties in with everything. I mean, I talked, to the guy who makes these microphones. And he was saying, oh, you got to get the one with the bloom line uh, transformer. It really sounds better. You know, and I, I was complimenting him on something he did. And he said, yeah, well, we try to keep a really tight uh, test cycle. You know, so we're always testing, getting feedback to the engineers, fixing it, testing it, you know, a lot between ship dates. And I'm going, you know, Games could use some of that too. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so I really noticed that in the people that I've uh, interviewed. You know, there'd be some game designers on here that you know they're talking about how much they love playing games and they play stuff all the time. Then you get another one, and he's just like, "Well, this, you know, the cells weren't quite where you wanted them to be, and you know, budgets and you know this and that kind of thing." And uh, yeah, some of them, you know, there's some people who are. Who transcend it all, you know, uh, Raph Coster and Richard Garriott, mm -hmm. you know, guys like that, you know, they're gamers and you don't have to talk. Well, well, Richard, you just have to know, you just have to know the history to know he's a gamer. You might, but if I sent somebody out with the, the elementary course and how to tell whether, whether or not somebody is a gamer, they might take Richard off the list, right? He might not pass because he's become so civilized, but he's still, <laughs> so, so you can't, you can't take all my rules of thumb th seriously. You know, you can't run out there and say, that guy's not a gamer. He's not going to put out good games. Some people actually progress beyond pure nerdiness and develop a, an ornate nerdiness that allows them to function on all kinds of levels. Richard is one, uh, Raph is, Raph is one, um, these guys really care about games, but they understand so much about so many other things that it's just uh, breathtaking. You know? Okay, I was thinking of, uh, you know, I, I stole this right off Wikipedia. You know, I thought, it, I thought, you know, this might be a good way to introduce you. Uh, so, can you? Are you still hearing me? I hear you, and and you're talking about me. So yeah, I'm yeah. just. Uh, <laughs> about me. So it says you composed over. 200 different computer and video games. Uh, since 1983, did the 7th Guest, Wing Commander, uh, Hard Nova, Maniac Mansion. Now, about the Maniac Mansion, was did you do the soundtrack for that, or was it just the uh, NES version? And was there any difference? I'm not really sure. What do you mean the soundtrack? 
I just said Wikipedia mentioned they had Maniac, Maniac Mansion thrown in with uh, like Loom and Wing Commander and all these other games. So I'm not. I mean, is that a legitimate one to have on the list? Or oh, uh, yeah, it's it's a little bit. Uh, I share it with others. Um, there was, uh, of course, Team Fat. I, I had uh, Dave Govett, who was my main composer for for Wing Commander too. Uh, he and I, and I think Dave Hayes. Is, is the name of the guy who uh, who did about the other third of it. And we all worked for Dave Warhol. And we did the music. Now, now I'm a little confused as to which is uh, Day of the Tentacle. I think we get credited with that sometimes. And isn't that a, a follow-up? Isn't that a, a, a sequel? Yeah, it's a or sequel to first... Maniac Mansion. I don't recall doing any Day of the Tentacle. I remember doing the first one. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I did the Surfer Guys theme. And uh, and we even Team Fat even performed that on surf guitars occasionally. Nobody knew what the heck we were doing, you know. I mean, no, no people would see us and go, "There's some surf band playing some tune," and, and no one ever put it together that we were playing this stuff from Maniac Mansion. I, but I, I, I did the your, surf uh, one. I looked up your mentor as uh, uh, from your high school band and listened to the Astronauts <laughs> a while ago. <laughs> You did? Yeah, I love that. Oh, I mean, that's, that's one of my favorite genres of music, the surf stuff. Oh, man. Uh, Bob Demon was was my high school band director and a big mentor and taught me about showmanship and cowboy outfits. And, and he was the music man in this town. I'm in Coronado, California. And he, he walked into this town with uh, cowboy outfits and five buttons up his sleeve and, and uh, you know, the... Elvis collar and the James Dean hair and just took this place by storm and uh, that was I don't know maybe 1970 right and he used to be in this surf band called the astronauts and he ran our marching band and so a few of us you know some people tagged him as kind of a bullshitter and a few of us just said no man this is this is a way of life and we just gathered around his feet and we soaked up all the stories and uh uh, yeah, he he meant a lot to me. He 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 passed on a couple of years ago, and uh, his estate sale was a, was about a year ago. And uh, I I bought like four guitars in one shot, so I've got some of the. That's my little little piece of Bob, you know, for history. But uh, Bob Demon is a great man, and 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 every once in a while I I expect if I if I do any Demonisms. During this uh, interview, I'll try to identify them. You know, uh, like uh, professionalism is being in the right place at the right time. You know, he 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 brought a whole generation of us school kids up that way, and and man, it stuck with us. So you'll, you'll uh, anyway. Thanks for for mentioning Bob, and thanks for listening to his uh, to his stuff. It sounds like uh, a, the astronauts. Serendipity. Serendipity. All right, so Loom and uh, Tux Racer, you know. <laughs> In one breath. So let's see, also an author. Yeah, I wanted to mention your book, of course. Well, the book has been out of print for ages, but it's coming it back. just came out. It just came out in E, in, in E form. So like just a couple months ago, but it's been out of print and unavailable for years. So uh, yeah, I'll I'll get a... I'll get a picture. You're good at intercutting stills. I noticed that. That's really effective. Uh, so I'll get you a picture of that. And uh, the URL for that is tinyurl.com slash tasty morsels. Tasty morsels. Yeah, I remember when I, I, I think I got that book through Interlibrary Alone and, uh, I just remember the girl at the reception desk was looking at the cover like, what is this? <laughs> That's been a problem. <laughs> Can I ask you, Matt, how old are you? Uh, 34, 35, somewhere in there. Really? Oh, you, you carry yourself like a proper hippie. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, in the... Uh, in the 60s, 70s, things, it seemed as though things could be a little more abstract uh, and still be handled by the creative public. And uh, uh, 
I've just kind of run into a whole lot of situations lately where you have to spell things out literally. And, and uh, to have a, a game musician wearing a, a, a cowboy hat and a, and a rhinestone suit and standing in a river. And in half of those pictures, I was carrying a coat hanger with nothing on it, you know, and doing gang signs. I think in the 70s, that would have been accepted as a proper album cover, right? Yeah, I mean, like, Captain uh, Beefheart, Frank Zappa, that kind of stuff, you know. I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> it's Trout Mask Replica. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, You don't want to hem yourself in too much with these literal meanings, you know. You, you, my life is not about, we've come a long way from the boops and beeps of yesteryear. Oh. You know, that is not oh, what I'm yeah. about. Uh, you know, I want to see people listen to music and go, wow, that's really fun, you know, and to say, I, I think I, I think I saw God, or I at least heard John Philip Sousa. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen that documentary? Uh, have, have, huh? have you seen that documentary about the guy who invented the Moog synthesizer? You mean Moog? Yeah, Moog, Robert, I don't know if it's Richard or Robert Moog, right? Robert Moog, yeah. Yeah. Well, the first one, that's, that's good. I have not seen his documentary but I'll tell you something. The only time I hung out with him, I was nervous as hell because I was trying to play a theremin. Mm -hmm. And he was watching over my shoulder. And that's also the only time I played played a theremin. And I'll tell you what, man, that is not an <laughs> instrument that you want to play when you're nervous. Cause it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my wife is, uh, desperately wants one of those things. I guess I'll have to find out how to get one or oh. build one. Uh, get the PAIA kit. It's cheap. It's been around for a thousand years. P, uh, PAIA is the company, and they're one of the people I had to cease and desist because they have a uh, the fat theremin. Huh? Yeah, fat. Yeah, they have uh, <laughs> the little fatty or something like that. Um, but there's there's my PAIA uh, rack mount. Okay. Know, kit. They, so they make these great. Uh, Great little kits. These are, you know, this is analog synth, and we can get into that if you, if you want to later. But, but uh, they make this kind of nice mid-level line of uh, of synth. So I've got the Moog one, which is top of the line. I'm I'm a sponsored Moog artist. Uh, I've got the the PAIA, which is midline, and and then I've got this kind of boopy, beepy, screechy, honky stuff uh, that uh, Tom Robertson made for me. Um, I don't know if you remember him from Barbie Fashion Designer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't he's, know if I've played that one or not. Uh, he's a great... I mean, yeah. it's like you get the makings of a mad science uh, scientist lair over there. You ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, I. Oh, I, wow. What I is do... that? Oscilloscope over there? Yeah, that's an oscilloscope that I built with my dad when I was a kid. There's a signal generator. Uh, wait, where is it? Here. Are you getting it? Yeah. Um, here's uh, some of the, the tools. There's the soldering station. It's like what you hook somebody up to when they won't talk, right? And here's the, some of the, I don't know if you can really see, there's the didgeridoo, the Indian flute is another okay. thing. The trombone, talking drums up top. Uh, there's a rain stick, a couple of vuvuvelas, uh, a banner trumpet, that's that long <laughs> the trumpet that's too long. There's my fiance. You gotta <laughs> Hello, have one of those. Hi, Cindy. Hi, chocolate. Yes, please. That's the best kind. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> Life is worth living. <laughs> well, so it's a mad science thing. Oh God, you should see the place that I'm staying in. I'm two weeks here. Uh, in San Diego for every week that I'm in Austin. And the guy I'm staying with in Austin, Bill Bottorf, um, I'm in a garage apartment there, but it is so, I mean, except for the crime fighting, which I'm really not sure he doesn't do, this guy lives so much like Batman. Um, my little apartment is super clean and it looks like Stately Wayne Manor, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's attached to the garage. The garage has... Jaguars and a stretch limo in it. I go upstairs and there's more oscillators and signal generators than I have here. And there's all these uh, uh, 
all these panels where Bill has arranged pictures of uh, Einstein, uh, Werner von Braun, Walt Disney, um, all, all these, you know, he, he's putting together his thoughts on the interconnections between rocket science, uh, gaming, fiction, religion, politics, history, all these things. And he, he puts them in these, I guess that Sherlock Holmes used to do this too. He puts them in little pictures, montages, and, and stares at them to try to get his thoughts together. And I look out the window, there's an observatory with about a six foot uh, diameter. And if you look past that, you see Bob Dell's house, which is like one of the biggest houses ever made. It's so Batman-y. It's super cool. Yeah, I think my dream is to have the house, a house with those fire poles that I can, you know, jump down and slide down into my gaming room. You know, that'd be. Yes, this needs, this <laughs> place needs a fire pole. And there's two kinds of people, Matt. There's, there's the kind like you and me, and then there's the kind like my brother. When my brother was building a two-story studio, I said, well, you're going to need a fire, fire pole. And he says, why would I want a fire pole? <laughs> why? <laughs> why? <laughs> why? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. The, the people who understand, you don't have to explain it to them. And the people who don't understand, you can't. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part two of my interview with the fat man. And I have a follow-up interview with him on Wednesday. So if you have ideas for questions or topics that you want me to be sure to discuss, uh, put them in the comment section on this video and I'll uh, be sure to uh, ask him about those. Now, as always, I wanna thank you if you have uh, supported the show and I'm asking everyone who is a fan to donate a buck and a quarter per episode. A buck and a quarter works out to $5 a month which is uh, coincidentally the minimum uh, payment you can set up through PayPal. Uh, so if you like these interviews and retrospectives and you want to keep uh, the show going, uh, take a moment to set that up. Really, really appreciate that. And you know what else I'd appreciate? That ale of the week. Uh, this time I have a W-I-T-T-E, which I believe is uh, pronounced wheat, kind of like a wheat, but wheat says it's worth the wheat, and this is brewed by the Omegang or Omegang Brewery um, from Cooperstown, New York. So it's another New York beer. It's, it says here 5.1% alcohol, which isn't, isn't bad at all, so this should be quite smooth. It says it's a traditional Belgian-style wheat ale, the light body, frothy head, and so on, coriander. <laughs> uh, pour slowly. Okay, so let's pour this. Get this open and see what the old wheat, and see if it's really worth the wheat. Open her up, see if I can do this without popping out an eye. Nice pop. I love the ones with corks like that. It never gets, never gets old. Let's go ahead and give this a smell. It's got that a nice, rich, uh, wheaty smell, which is kind of a peachy, citrusy kind of a thing. Really, really nice, but uh, let's taste. It's got that, it really does have that, uh, a really concentrated wheat uh, taste. If you've uh, tasted a Blue Moon, uh, for example, it's sort of like that, but more concentrated. It's actually quite nice, uh, very smooth, uh, no alcohol uh, taste whatsoever. I mean, just a little bit of a bitter, a little bit of a bitter aftertaste, but uh, definitely not not bad, uh, not unpleasant. Actually, uh, quite nice. I uh, very much like this one. I'm a big fan of uh, wheat ales, uh, so a really good wheat like this makes me very happy. <laughs> All right, uh, how about that quotation? I uh, found a really interesting quotation, I thought, from uh, Walt Disney. It goes uh, something like this. You're dead if you aim only for kids. Adults are only kids grown up. See you guys next week.
Have you ever heard of the bubonic plague, Manuel? It was very popular here at one time. A lot of pedigree hamsters came over on ships from Siberia. What do you do? I'm sorry, Manuel, this is a rat. No, no, it's hamster! He's not hamster. Hamsters are small and cuddly. Cuddle this, you'd never play the guitar again. <laughs>